Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and today's episode is an interview with filmmaker Ed McCarthy. Now, Ed's short film, They Fall Fast, won the Programmer's Prize at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival in 2018. And it's one of those films that is so memorable and so impactful that I can tell you staff and people who saw it two years ago still talk about it, which is kind of the true test of a film, right? If you remember it a couple years later, clearly it had an impact. And if you want to watch it right now, you can just go to Amazon Prime Video and look up Discover Indie Film. There you're going to see the companion series to this podcast. And in season two, episode three... You're going to see They Fall Fast paired with another great film called Shark Week. So I highly recommend that you do that and watch the film. But you know what? I don't think there's any spoilers in this interview, so feel free to just keep on listening. All right, after the interview, I'll give you a bunch of links and things to look up. But for now, let's talk to Ed. How do I make a long story short? Yeah, your origin story. Yeah, my origin story. Um, I started in a lab. Um, No, I mean, like anyone, you grow up watching... TV and film. And I grew up on, uh, on Long Island. I was born in Queens, raised in Long Island. And I was the youngest of four boys. So we didn't go to many movies growing because, you know, movies even then were expensive for a family of six. Um, uh, but I do remember going to things like Superman and E.T. Uh, but for, like, th- th- those movies were very impressionable, obviously. But what made more of an impression for me was watching television. Uh, you know, it was with my parents and we had our shows as a family and the shows I watched with mom, the shows I watched with dad, you know, with mom, it was usually soap operas, you know, not slanding Falcon crest, things yeah, like the, that. The, the, the golden era. Of yeah, nighttime. exactly. Nighttime soaps. And my dad was more like comedies. I remember cheers. Cheers. Um, taxi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ta- things like that. So, so, uh, through them and through the communal experience, that's when I appreciated the t- television as a medium, but, but you also growing up you, thousands and thousands of miles away from Los Angeles, that's not a career. Like I didn't pay attention to credits. Right. I didn't think of that. So I went to, um, uh, I went to college and got my, de- my degree in English education and became a high school English teacher straight out of college. Um, but I, I, I guess because I love stories, you know, not because I And had I you been a writer? Had you been writing? I had. I was toying with majoring creative writing for a little bit. And, and in college, uh, I was um, at NYU and, and at college, I took some playwriting courses. And I was always complimented, uh, uh, you know, about my, uh, you know, uh, regarding my, you know, one-act plays at that point. And I entered some kind of contest uh, for NYU students. And it was three one-act plays were going to be picked and directed by you know, I think uh, graduate students who were studying theater and, you know, I, I, I was one of the three selected. And so they made this big kind of thing, you know, it was like a whole weekend on one of the, the you know, small theaters in, in, in New York city. And everyone said they really liked the play. And, but I felt like a fraud because I felt like I was making stuff up. Like I'm, I'm like 19 years old and what do I know about life kind of thing. Really? So, so instead of being like, yeah, I'm going to be a playwright, you thought you had a little bit of imposter yeah, syndrome? I was literally going to say, yeah, you know, it's like imposter. I felt like someone's going to, one point person would point me out and like, you made all that up. And I'm like, yeah, I did. And But you're supposed to. I know. And that, that, <laughs> that's the disconnect there. So I felt, you know, I just felt like I didn't have life experience. In retrospect, like, I didn't know what I was feeling at the time. I just felt uncomfortable and, and whatnot. But I just feel like, you know, life experience really helps a person in, in their writing. Um, but I taught for several years. And then, you know, I got an MFA in creative writing from there. Okay, um, yeah. Focusing on before on, or after there was you were teaching out after yeah. After so I left writing. this profession. Got it. I realized I, I really wanted to. I was going to turn into. A, I was a well liked teacher uh, for a, a while uh, during while I was teaching, but I was going to turn into that middle aged teacher that everyone hated um, because it's very hard to be a teacher. Um, you know, you have to give so much of yourself. Um, you know, um, and and I realized. I wanted to create story, not write story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, write story, not teach story, I should say. Um, so I got my MFA in creative writing, focusing on, on fiction and screenwriting. And my goal is to be a TV writer, like like I said, growing up to television. So that's when I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, I've been here for about eight years. And I just studied. After the MFA or you got the MFA Yeah, I got, my, I got my MFA and then I moved out and here. Yeah, here. Um, 
And, you know, I've had jobs in post-production. I've had jobs in development. I've had jobs uh, in terms of producing, line producing. Um, I've had jobs as a writer assistant um, in, in TV shows. Um, which and, is the way in. Which is the way yeah. in, right. I just got off a gig last week as a writer assistant. Um, I'm up for a gig for a writer assistant for another show. Hopefully I'll find out. I can find it any day now. Um, and that, that hopefully will segue into an actual writer's position um, in, a, in a room. But I also want to make my own stuff. So Yeah, so you got the bug to direct? Yeah. I, I, I first wrote the, They Fall Fast or wrote this short. Um, and at first I wasn't sure if I was going to direct it. But I figured, why not? You know, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I wanted I wanted to direct at some point, even though I see myself as a writer primarily. So I'm like, why not? You know, just let's do it. And um, and that was the first one. That was my yeah, I, right. Yeah. So I'm, like, not even just like a little assignment. Uh, no, not even like a yeah, because like, you were doing a pure writing program. Yeah, all yeah, all the way yeah. Through. So my MFA was all writing. Yeah. yeah. So so and at that point, I've been on enough sets that you know, being on a set's not foreign to me. What 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 a you know, the, the department heads in the each crew position, uh, what each crew member does, that wasn't a foreign concept. So, so uh, I mean, I was comfortable on sets. Um, so, Right. And yeah. you wrote They Fall Fast and, and you looked at it and said, you know, based on the logistics and the way it's written. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like it's two person. Um, yeah. It's it's for uh, at least half of it. They're, you know, it's a technical stunt. So, you know, but they're not moving. I don't have to worry about blocking as much as I do about logistics yeah. of this falling. And yeah, you don't have car mounts. You yeah, don't have, yeah. You don't so, have, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the most challenging part was a walk and talk. Um, actually, that is the only part of the film that I feel like the flow is broken up a little bit more than I want it to be. Um, I would disagree. Yeah, I don't have right. any problem with your flow. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, but it being, you know, there was like really three locations, which is the parking lot uh, and with the car, uh, the trail where they're walking and then the actual quicksand. Uh, and then we repeat the parking lot and the trail on the way back. Um, but, um, yeah, but it yeah. shows how well your story structure is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt confident enough in the, in the script, and I had actors that I felt really comfortable with. And I feel like it's about finding the the, the DP was the big piece of the puddle, puzzle. Uh, and I found uh, someone, uh, her name is Rose, who's phenomenal. Uh, I'd work with her again in a heartbeat. Um, she really cares about, you know, what you know, what's on the page and what I wanted to see as a director. And then she's like, okay, you know, let's, let's, the she, you have to trust the DP. I've, I've, and trust every person, um, you know, to find, I don't have the vocabulary to be like, these are the specific lenses I want. Uh, I, this is, you know, I, but I don't need that vocabulary. I've, I came to realize because it's, you have to trust people to be experts in their field. So as long as I could articulate the kind of thing I want to see and how wide or yeah, tight, and the emotions, you know, and, the emotions and what I'm going after, yeah. um, they have the vocabulary and yeah. the technique. And then are you watching on the monitor anyway? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 you're, and you're yeah. seeing, and you can say, well, that one I'm not super, but yeah, we I, it sounds village. like you were really happy with what you were Absolutely. seeing. Absolutely. We had a video village, a very small one, um, you know, because uh, uh, though it's a tight, you know, production, I also want it to be a right production, right, done correctly. So, yeah, we definitely had, you know, we we did uh, with Alexa um, cameras. Yeah. Uh, we had a video village. Um you know, we had, I think the crew was about 25. Um, it, it was, which it is was, really good with the, yeah, the camera department, but that's we, partially also because of your work and you knew people. Yeah. You we knew people, yeah and and we also got a really good together. line producer, this guy, Sam, who, who really helped, you know, get a, a first AD for me that was outstanding. And, um, and, you know, like I said, trust, trust everyone in their roles. Um, uh, we had, we did have two cameras for the stunt, uh, one camera for, we, it was a two-day shoot, so day one was, um, you know, the the trail, the parking lot, and all that stuff. Day two was 100 percent the um, the quicksand stunt, and we got a little bit of B-roll footage that day. Um, so, and for and for day two, we had two cameras, so. right? Which is smart because you're you're getting you're doubling your coverage right there. Yeah, exactly. And we knew the morning was going to be devoted in getting um, Carlos's the character Carlos his coverage, and then after lunch we got uh, Eileen's coverage. Um, and yeah, and we just needed, we just knew that that sequence was going to make or break the short. Uh, and we wanted, you know, I've also worked in post-production and with a lot of editors, you know, the, the problem is they don't have enough coverage. And, and so I wanted to make sure that 
yeah. that, that that quicksand scene we had as much coverage as yeah possible. i mean there's nothing first film it might have been your first directing but it doesn't sound like anything was first time-ish because you you did all the right things and you 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 created the situation to succeed by by yeah by I mean, doing it the right way. If you set yourself up for success, um, and I think going into something, there's a difference between going something in, in, into something blind versus going into something unaware. Um, and I, you know, if you do your research and you're aware of every stage of the, like the process and what everybody does, um, then you know you might be going into a situation slightly blind but you're not going into yeah. it yeah and you weren't blind to anything because you had experience yeah. in right at yeah. the writing stage and the post-production stage and you'd been on set so you really were familiar with everything yeah yeah totally um you know especially that post stage because that's where a lot of people find out they've messed up yeah and my editor ruth uh who's also a dear friend of mine she um she I, I made it better. You know, that's what, you know, I think that's what, you know, you feel, I feel, I felt very confident in the script. Um, you know, I felt confident in my ability, you know, as a producer and as a director, even though it was my first time, but any position, they make it better. The, the DP Rose, she made it better. Um, you know, well, they, to compliment you, they couldn't have made it better if you hadn't done well, such great work. And, and really a director's job is often to support their whole team and make sure everyone's doing their best. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree with the, yeah, the director needs to set the tone um, and allow people to, to breathing room to do their job. And your performances and also, are superb. Yeah. Uh, Mim and Victor, they are outstanding. Yeah. We, we auditioned um, uh, Rick Pagano, the casting director who I worked with on other stuff. He's really um, you know, a seasoned casting director, Emmy nominated, and he read the short, you know, and he's like, I like this. I want to cast this for you. And I'm like, for real? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, all right, I won't turn that down. Uh, so yeah, we, um, we, we did two days of casting, um, in a, a Santa Monica office and, uh, Mim, the actress who played Eileen was literally the first person who auditioned, uh, but the, over two days. But of course, you have to see everyone. But she right, was you always, saw thirty, forty more. And yeah, yeah, and she was obviously, you know, um, from the first audition, uh, you know, on the top of the list. Um, but yeah, and and then you know, it's about picking who would be the two. You know, though she was always on the top of the list. It's right. Like, all right, and who, then who played well with right? Her. Who would play well with you know whoever we wanted for Carlos and you know because they need to be they're two characters who are very contrasting and totally different from each other, but they still need to be complementary. Um, so, so we felt like, you know, Carlos has a little bit of comedic lightness to him. And Eileen had, you know, her circumstances in life are arguably worse uh, than, than Carlos's. Um, so she needed to be a little bit more bitter is not the right word, but a little bit more maybe jaded, a sharp edge. Jaded, overwhelmed. Yeah. She's overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. So she has a very jaded and sharp edge to her, but not, um, but there's still, uh, you know, she has like biting one line, uh, one liners that there's still humor and there's still life to her. So she, that was a very complicated, I felt, you know, character. Yeah. Well, on, on the page, it was, there was a lot of depth. Mm-hmm. A lot of depth on the page, and then she didn't let you down at all. She no. she made it all very much alive. Oh no, she the first time I saw the quicksand se- sequence, um, uh, in the first cut that Ruth did, I got teary eyed, and I you know don't want to be like you know I wrote it, so obviously I knew what was going to happen. But even when you know she was sinking and he he sank, even I was like you know had that like wow like am am I are they going to come up, you know, yeah. which is obviously what I want the audience to feel. So, you know, during that process, a couple of months of posts, you know, because everyone's working on, you know, scraping time together off from their free time. Uh, you, when you get deep into weeds, you always feel uncertain. So for me, whenever I was watching a cut and I just didn't feel like, Oh, well, is this working anymore? I always go back to that first time, that first cut. And I'm like, how did I feel? And you know, that is what I always had. You had to hold on to, um, because after the 11th, 12th time seeing something, it's no longer fresh. So you have to remember what was like that fresh, you know, the first time when it was, um, so that, yeah, that quick, quicksand sequence was probably the thing that changed the least in the editing process. Once, once we had the first or second cut down, um, you know, that one we changed, you know, obviously we added a little bit and trimmed dialogue here and there. Um, but yeah, that, that, that quicksand sequence was, you know, I, I just always went back to how I felt the first time, you know. 
Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And and the inspiration for the story before yeah. I turned on the mics, you and I were talking actually yeah. about about um, when your parents are ailing and things. So I guess you do have insight into caretaking. I do. Um, the character of Eileen is 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 based on my mom, who I actually gave my mom's name was Eileen, and and she has since passed. Um, you know, but I did write this actually after my dad passed away. Mm-hmm. You know, so if people have not seen the short. Um, you should yeah. stop right now and go watch it yes. and then come back to, so you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, briefly the character of Eileen is dealing with, um, you know, her husband is, is at the very last stages, uh, of pancreatic cancer. So it's a, and her, she, he will literally be coming on the next day. Um, you yeah, know, for hospice, for hospice yeah. yeah, for end of life care. So, you know, I, I, I know when my my dad passed away and, and talking to my mom about, you know, her life, she grew up in a generation that, you know, women didn't have the choices, you know, um, that they should have had. You know, she was the youngest. I'm sorry, she was the oldest of, of three, but the other two were boys. So she always talked about, you know, she was really strong in math and wanted to be a businesswoman. I had like an internship in high school, I think it was, um, with an accounting office. And she really wanted to go that route. But you know, they were like, no, you get a job and you be a caretaker and you be, you know, um, a mother. Yeah. In that um, era, a woman was expected. Yeah. To, to, to be a full time. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're not seen as, as potential like breadwinner or potential, you know, uh, business, um, you know, uh, owner or anything like that. Um, or just even working in a business unless you're a secretary type, type of thing. So, and, and telling, and, and, you know, as a kid, they're just mom, you know, as an adult, you get to know them on a, uh, you know, and hopefully on a different level. And it becomes more about learning, you know, who she was before mom, you know, uh, and so I realized all these, the life she could have had if she didn't get married and, you know, and not that she could have had, or she, maybe she didn't. Um, but now, and now that my dad had died, you know, who is she now? And, you know, reinventing herself kind of a thing. So that's, that, that was the kind of inspiration for the Eileen character, someone who has primarily been defined by wife and mother. And now that her, you know, husband is, you know, near the end of his, his life. And also his, her daughter, um, is at the end of her college, um, education. Uh, those roles as wife, as wife and mother, those roles are kind of, blurred or about to be non-existent yeah uh, so who am and i and the now? role of caretaker because she's been mm-hmm. uh, pink cancer is not fast it is not and it is yeah. and it becomes all consuming so yeah yeah so yeah yeah which clearly well obviously explains why it's so well written because there's so much so much there Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And it's how to, how to get all that there in the 17 pages of the script. <laughs> <laughs> Were you tempted to make it longer? It was. Actually, the script was longer. And it, and it, the first cut, I mean, the cut right now is about 12 minutes. The first cut, I forget exactly how long, but it was uh, north, a little uh, I think it was north of 15 minutes. Um, it's because, you know, like anything, sometimes things worked at the script level and you realize, you know, with the footage you have, you're like, you know what, this joke really worked on the page. It It feels, you know... It, it, it's not matching the tone that the footage we're seeing here. You are describing so. the best quality of editing, which is where you recognize the stuff you don't need mm-hmm. because a lot of people don't. Yeah. And I think that's the fault to like some shorts are, are far too long because, you know, people are too precious or movies are far too long. It doesn't have to be short. Um, but we realized, oh, wow, this line, this was a great discussion on the page. Um, but yeah, like there, there, there's a the, when they're walking, we get a little bit more about how they met on the internet and and things like that. So there's there's a discussion there that that it, it just felt like, you know, we don't need this, we don't need this, and and there were jokes in there, and and I and I found that after I showed it to a couple of people, they didn't dislike it, but they wanted to get to the mystery of where are they, where are they going, was much more captivating, um, you know, than some of the jokes that they were making. So I'm like, okay, let, let's get to the quicksand faster. Um, and so that was my goal. Which yeah. really shows why, I mean, you weren't a kid making a film in his, in his early twenties, but mm-hmm. it's, I mean, but yeah, it's such mature filmmaking to real, to, to see what, what the heart of the mm-hmm. matter is and, and to get to it more efficiently. Mm-hmm. Believe me, that's when people give me stuff to look at, the number one note is get to it faster. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's the complicated thing is when you're a writer, 
slash director and slash producer, you have to remember where you are in the moment of that. Um, so when I'm a writer, that's all I care about when I'm directing. I just want to get the best co coverage and to get best performances I can. And when you're an editor or working with the editor, I should say, um, none of that kind of it matters, but yeah, I never remember. I know, I'm not it the writer. Yeah. You're being you're being loyal to the material, but also yeah. to an audience. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and it's truly people say editing is the last rewrite, and it's completely true. And you need to divorce yourself from the writer that you were when you create created the script, um, or the director you were when you were getting it, getting the coverage and footage, um, because there are some shots you, yeah, I want to be precious to it, and I really like that reaction, um, but yeah, I mean, you just need to. You need to create the story with the footage you have then at that point, um, not, what, not what was written on the page. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it is that last read. Well, that's, so that's why it came out so well. And, and then you finished it, uh, yeah, I, so, I would imagine, the year before I saw yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> it, it, you know, like anything, it's a process. It's a slow thing of, I, once I had it, I wrote it fairly quickly. You know, I, the first draft came out actually in two days and then, then, you know, with notes and stuff. So, but then it became like sitting on a shelf, not because I didn't want to do anything, but you know, uh, it, it, even indie stuff and uh, shoestring budget stuff, there's still a budget and, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, this, this, and you decided to direct it pretty soon after writing it. Yeah. For some reason I felt maybe cause I, like uh, discussing my mom earlier, I felt a, a certain closeness to this that I, if someone was going to screw it up, I wanted it to be me kind of a thing. <laughs> so humble. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so, so yeah. So but um, the truth is what you did is you, you made it, you made it wonderful. So. Yeah. I think, yeah. Thank you. And, and yeah, I'm super proud of it and, um, uh, and all the work everyone did, uh, as part of it. But, but yeah, this, this, um, production company called Gumption Pictures, um, you know, they have an indie spirit like you do and, and, and an artist spirit and, and they wanted to help bring it to life. Um, so, you know, I'm thankful to them for doing so. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So they did it. And in conjunction with, um, my buddy who I produced it with Miguel uh, and his production company, tangible matter, um, we were able to, to get it done, um, and rent all the equipment and pay the crew. Um, you know, I'm also, you know, just because it's indie and low budget doesn't mean it should be free. I have that kind of mentality. So I, I definitely, if I was going to do it, I wanted to make sure people, you know, got some payment out of this, um, you know, and it got paid for their couple of days um, of, of work. Yeah, I know it's impossible to say, but I wouldn't be surprised if if that pay people for their time ethos, even if it wasn't much, is another reason for the quality because, you know, on yeah. the day of the people doing it as a favor. Yeah. If it's a favor, it's, they have to really be a close friend right. to, to, to give their best. And you can only phone in a few favors. Yeah. Uh, I feel like uh, some people called me in for favors. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. You know, if I really believe in the person or friends with the person or the material, um, you know, but I, I don't like asking for favors like that because it is free work. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a different thing if someone is just starting out and they just got out of school and they're looking for credits and looking to build a network. Um, and so they might be free labor for some of their friend stuff and, and things like that. Uh, that's the way that it goes. But I, I do believe that it's, it's a double-edged sword because a lot of this stuff that we watch and like, um, you know, and especially in the indie world, wouldn't exist if there weren't favors called in and free true, labor. True. Um, but you your know, film is not a bunch of kids. No, it is not. Throwing it's together. They're all pros. You yeah. know, um, you know, my DP came from AFI. Um, you know, the, the editor I use has been editing, uh, you know, Ruth, she's a good friend. She's been editing for years and years and years. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, yeah. You know, and the line producer, uh, Sam, he, he's done a bunch of producing, uh, and UPM and line producing stuff, and uh, of shorts. So, um, you know, definitely the people used uh, on crew are not amateurs, you know, and you just, you know, and, and if you will pay them and even if it's, you know, not even like just barely scale, you know, that's, a I mean, we were um, SAG, but we weren't union below the line kind of stuff, but um yeah, actually we were only SAG. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to be the, the case. That tends to be the case. Yes. Yeah. And so now, so after you started your, your festival run, mm -hmm. and we, did you have a really good one? Um, a good festival I guess, run? I guess, that's, I guess that's a leading question. Because, it is. I mean, I mean, my expectation is that 
that you should have had a wonderful festival run. It, it, you know, the festival, I thank you. Um, you know, I am very happy now that um, it literally had its last festival uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, and so looking back, I, I am happy with this festival run. Going into it, um, you know, when you're bright eyed and bushy tailed, uh, you're very happy with the work and you expect, you know, to have a great festival run and great, uh, you know, um, but there's so many shorts out there and showing you, you know, uh, limited spots in these festivals. It got rejected a lot. Um, yeah. Yes, it was. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but but yeah, it got. And I did get nice notes from, you know, Austin Film Festival saying it made it, you know, to I think the last round before it got cut. Um, and even Sundance gave me a nice note. And I don't, it didn't feel like a generic note saying, hey, we really like this. And and it was like, I, I forget, there was one or two sentences that made it feel like, oh, this is not like, you know, this is not generic. It's not the form yeah, letter. Yeah. yeah. So, so and, and there were a couple other, you know, reputable ones that, you know, and by reputable, I mean just known that it, it, I got notes about, you know, it making it far into the process. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's Sherman Oaks was, I think. It's first film festival. Oh, was it the first? Yeah, Sherman Oaks was its premiere, um, which was great because I live in Sherman Oaks. Um, See, I had no darn idea yeah. that... Uh... Yeah. I'll be honest. I was going through a little bit of a, you know, artist dark space for a little bit because I think it was about six or seven months of rejections at that point. Um, and, or like, hey, made it really far. Um, but, you know, but I was just like, I don't know what's going on. So when I got that email from, from Sherman Oaks, I was like, finally, someone, someone likes it. And it's I'm validation. pumping my fist yeah. right now. Because yeah. So it's interesting because I've heard from other filmmakers who've come in for a podcast. Sometimes they say like, I wasn't getting in anywhere. And then I got in mm -hmm. to Sherman Oaks or Film Invasion. And then they, the yeses started coming. Yeah, And, it was, and I, I wonder yeah. if there is like, some festivals need. I'll be crude and say the cherry has to be popped at some I, point. No, I think that I think you're absolutely right. And because after that, it then got in. It's like had about four or five festivals. Um, uh, so um, and it really is very good. It's I know a, a filmmaker who's she's very talented, and she was very jaded about the festival process and rejections. And then she actually <laughs> ended up on a jury mm. for a festival. And then she started posting on Facebook. I just want everyone to know that yeah. when they tell you they love your film but don't have space for it, they mean it. Yeah, it's to and I, I, I totally, you know, it's funny because the festival and 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 in your program or so, you know, you might hear some of this stuff too. A lot of it's like people say you need to know the programmer or, and I didn't know you until no. beforehand, so that's obviously not the case. <laughs> um, but you know, there there is um, also. A numbers game it's it's just like you know they they're getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of submissions uh, and shorts you know are easier to make than features you know uh because they take less time and um so i would imagine that some of these festivals are getting a lot more shorts than maybe features um, yeah i mean i, I can't know. even imagine yeah. how many sundance and you know the the biggies receive mm -hmm. I, yeah. i've never seen the number but yeah i i heard once there's a few thousand made per year. And mm -hmm. Who's not going to apply to Sundance? Who right, doesn't? exactly, and and it's and it's great, and, and absolutely, and maybe maybe if someone got into a Sundance Lab or something, like they maybe they have a like they're up locked in, yeah. yeah. So, um, but honestly, I went to Sundance like ten years in a row back in the nineties, and mm -hmm. and the shorts aren't great. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I never understood their their process, right? And there's some festivals. Every festival you go to, you see some shorts, and you're like, oh, like, and sometimes you're like, oh, I don't respond to it but i get it um and sometimes you're like what okay what happened there um but yeah and and sometimes i i don't want to be a skeptic or or bitter but sometimes you're like is this some for some film, film festivals a money grab because some you, you sometimes you're like they're not even watching it because you know if you are vimeo where you have to submit via well film freeway um not without a box anymore but you know you have to upload your vimeo with your password the link and you can see how many times your your you thing can, is but you know what we we ran an experiment. Uh, oh, really? Uh, uh, yeah, a filmmaker. She posted on Facebook, you know, that I don't think they're watching. And I said, hey, if you want, uh, she was through without a box. She okay. was a without a box user back when you had a choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so I said, here, uh, I'll make you a judge. You watch your film and you go back to Vimeo and see if your see number it. went up. And she watched the whole thing and her number didn't go up. Really? I wonder so, what that so is. So actually, it could be the way it's embedded oh. at, without a box. I don't know. We didn't test it with Film Freeway. Yeah. 
But I thought it was very interesting that uh, that is interesting. That, that that actually you that know she tested it for that us. That makes me feel um, better. Yes, because you can see you know Vimeo the source and who sees it directly from Vimeo, Vimeo and then you can see without a box. And yeah. you see, so so the numbers were not adding up for me, which made me think that. That Some, they weren't watching. Some weren't even watching I think it. they probably, well, you know, who knows? Yeah, I can't I mean, speak absolutely. for other festivals, yeah. and Lord knows. But I do know also from, from our end, the mm-hmm. festival end, sometimes it uh, you're forced, instead of watching it embedded in Film Freeway, it says, can only be viewed on Vimeo. Oh. And, I, and then you have to click, and it opens Not another window. Vimeo. Okay. And I wonder if that's someone who's caught on, that if they want to see how much it's been watched, that they somehow you are able to pull them to right do. into the page. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if embeds work. For the stats, yeah, they should. They should theoretically, and sometimes they do. So sometimes because they, they this will tell me the video sources without a box, yeah. as opposed to or or film pre ray. Should um, run that test again. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's actually uh, makes me feel better because you know that was that was you know one of the things that made me feel a little bit like disenchanted with the process. Yeah. It's like you feel like you're submitting, and you know submitting to ten film festivals is going to cost a, you know a few hundred to. Two, three hundred bucks, four hundred bucks. Yeah, no, I've, um, I know people who spent more on festival mm-hmm. submissions than they did on the film. No, uh, no, that's totally accurate. And yeah. now, uh, you know, before doing this, you know, you work on productions, and I see line budget items for film festivals, and it makes total sense now um, because if you want your film to have a shot, you really need to play the numbers and try to submit to. Many film festivals. It's like college, right? You, you apply to the, the, your, your top five right. schools, and yeah. then you've got like ten backup schools. Right. Your reach, your safe, um, you know, your safe schools, and you know, um, uh, yeah, no, it's great. So yeah, so I'll be honest. The Sherman Oaks Film Festival was a great experience uh, because number one, it was validation it got accepted. It was the first, first film festival. It was literally in where I live, Sherman Oaks. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of friends were able to come out and, and to see it and to, yeah, you had a nice audience and that would, I believe you were in a really good block. Yeah. It was some really good stuff in that, that block. Um, it was, it was a nice, healthy block too. Um, because of diversity and types of film plus time, total, total running time. Because there are some blocks I'm like, this is so long. This is so long. Um, and yeah, I refuse to go over, I think, 40 minutes. 40, 45 is a cap. That's mm-hmm. only if we get forced. Mm-hmm. If, if filmmakers are like, no, please let me get in that, 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 that time that, that, slot. That time I can yeah. only attend Sunday yeah. at noon. And I'm like, uh, fine, we'll add one more film. But yeah, because... Yeah. Yeah, ideally, you'll just watch films for 30, 40 minutes and then talk about them for an hour. Right, right, right. And I've been in, you know, film festivals that the block was three hours long. Three? Yeah. I actually haven't heard. I've I've heard of the 90-minute block, like the feature-length block, and then they... And then I've heard, oh, what's it? Someone called it like the lineup of doom where they bring all the directors in front (laughs) Mm -hmm. and they just stand and say, okay, wave. Yeah. And sometimes they let audience ask each person one question or they just say go down the line left to right and say your name your film and uh your budget yeah it was uh oh budget oh that's that horrible yeah, that's a horrible question oh i would not and I would, you wouldn't lie i would plead the fifth on that one uh, you should yeah I I would, whenever an audience member asks that during the q a i always try to interrupt and go you don't have to answer okay yeah so that's like oh i don't know if that's public knowledge uh shouldn't be yeah i mean yours is i uh, you know i I, I do, you know, before I, I critique anything, um, I, I think it's great that um, film festivals still have a Q&A for shorts programs and filmmakers, because uh, often they are overlooked, I think, in the grand scheme of, of, of things for film festivals. But um, yours was the first one actually had uh, first and only one where it was an individual individual Q&A. Really? It was the only one? It was the only one. Uh, every other one they called uh, the filmmakers up front. So there was like a panel of us. Um and right, so so your uh, your producer and your DP and your actor couldn't be with you. No, yeah, it was just just me, yeah. just me. Um, and so so th- for those, uh, one of them was just a ro- like a you know like a yeah, assembly line, line like yeah. question, answer, 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 question. So so the the the, the questions were a little bit more general. Um, another one, uh, the uh, other two I was part of um, was more like you know general for about. 10 minutes, like, and then any audience questions that you had for the filmmakers or a specific film, um, uh, which I prefer that lineup, I think, um, because if you're an audience member and you really want to know something about a specific film, you, 
you know, that's the time to do it. Yeah. And it, and it, and allows everyone, cause I, I always believe that that question, other people have that question that's in their true. heads is some, you know, it's, it's generally, yeah. And it takes the extrovert to a- ask that question. It does. It takes the one, uh, it takes, takes mm-hmm. somebody to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I appreciated the, 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 I do appreciate the one-on-one and I think having, um, a program. And it was great to have, I know, I know that Mim joined you. Mim I was joining me. I can't remember who yeah, else was Yeah, it was just me and Mim. Just you and Mim. Yeah, okay. uh, the, the, um, uh, Miguel was there, my producer, uh, right. partner. He and was shy, yeah, yeah, he a little bit. And he's like, you talk, you do the talking. Um, and he's also Portuguese. So he's like, no, you talk, you talk. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, uh, he's like, you're better at talking. <laughs> And um, uh, some of the other producers from Gumption were there. Uh, the DP couldn't make it because she was uh, due to give birth any day there. So, yeah, she's like, I... She I, had a good excuse. Yeah, she goes, I will join the next one. And she did. Um, so, yeah, and the editor was there and some, some friends and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a really good bunch. Um, and and the number of, you know, the, the seats, um, in terms of the number of seats, it was really good. It was big and intimate at the same time. You know, yeah, yeah, that happens to be. Well, I'm glad that we were your first. We yeah. were your premiere, and yes. and you had a good experience. Thanks for being gentle, and we we set you up for the expectation that you would get to sit there alone <laughs> over and over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, but it's it's good. I mean, I mean that's the thing with people making shorts is they want to prove themselves so they can make something else. For me, I'm like I said, I see myself as a writer, so I want people to say, hey, he can. Look what he could do with character and dialogue in, in twelve right. minutes. Right. So, so, so you for you it was a bit of a calling card as a writer, but also as a director. Do you no, think you'll want to direct more? There is. I mean, uh, when because you should. Yeah, I, I really you. think you should. There's an idea that comes to me, and I, you know, I, I usually start the writing, and I don't think of the directing part. Um, for they fall fast very quickly. I started seeing it. So that's why I'm like, let me try to direct it. And I haven't really mm-hmm. thought of that until I'm just started, um, another, and by, I'm not even writing the script yet. It's just more an outline stage, but a feature, uh, very small indie, primarily two person, but you know, a few other character feature, um, that, yeah, f- some visually it's coming to me a lot more like, like they fall fast did. So this one, I, I do think I would want to direct, um, with the same DP I already talked to Rose, um, you know, but emailed Rose and we're like, want to get together soon, you know, in yeah. LA, that could mean yeah. four months from now, True. but, um, but get yeah. coffee and say, exactly. well, I've got another one. Yeah, and, and this and- is what I have, you know, in mind. Um, but yeah, it's, this is, this is a feature that I, I, I definitely would like to try to do. Um, oh, cool. yeah. So I won't ask you to give away what it's about, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that, mm-hmm. that, that I'll see more from you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll make sure it's submitted to Sherman Oaks Film Festival. Well, yes, absolutely. I can't promise when, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> sometime in the 2020, and that hard to believe it'll be in the 2020s. That's It'll scary. be in the twenties. The roaring twenties are coming back. They are. I can't, I do like jazz music. And so the deadline can, for 2019 has passed. So what do you know? So yeah. It's um, all about 2020. It's all about 2020 now. now. Mm. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll, we'll get our flapper outfits. And, I like it. I like and, that. And do it up. I, I'll do that. You know. Well, so now spoil, I, I can throw in the spoiler that even though you didn't direct it, I ended up, I'm watching mm-hmm. the stuff submitted to Sherman Oaks this year now, buried in it. <laughs> but you're buried, you're deep in, you're in the deep end right I'm now. I'm deep in, I'm deep in. And by the way, just to, I, I guess it's me begging for empathy, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, one reason why I just love films like yours so much is, is you know, I have no idea what it does to a, a person emotionally to watch four or five bad ones in a row. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, a couple hundred films, they're yeah, not you, all going to be good. And then yeah. when you see something good, you know, you start to see yourself, oh, my God, mm. are we going to, you know, because uh, everyone watches and then you sort them on a spreadsheet mm. based on the average grade and yeah. all that. And, mm-hmm. and you're like, OK, are we going to be showing God, that wasn't good enough to show. Am I going to have to show that? Yeah. yeah. So it really is nice to see quality films yeah. that are I'm sure. Well made. And as a, pro- a programmer, it must be nerve wracking if you see like five, six, seven bad ones in a row. You're like, what am I going to do? Yeah. yeah. No, you literally, I start to panic. Yeah. I start to panic and I start to think, uh, uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, this is my fourth year doing it. So hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll calm the heck down. But anyway, mm-hmm. so I, I saw uh, 
a really innovative little sci-fi short. Mm. And then I saw your name on it. Yeah. And then of all things, I actually did uh, in Film Freeway, it shows uh, a little director bio. And I recognized your friend from who you brought with you to the mixer. Yeah. I guess he was your producer on the Fall Yeah, so that's Miguel. The the, the mysterious Portuguese. (laughs) Yes, the Portuguese man. Um, He's in Portugal right now visiting family. Um, But yeah, Miguel, uh, he's a really, you know... uh, you know, I consider him family, um, you know, a friend you consider family type thing. And uh, we've, uh, it's our goal to be, you know, me, right, he direct. Because he, he, he is a director. Yeah. Um, Had you worked that way with him before? Or? Uh, well, on some projects, but this is the one that, um, you know, we had this idea um, that I had a clear, I had, I had the characters and the clear arc for it. Um, and he, and it's also the, like, okay, you got to use what you have and, you know, something that we could film in his apartment building in downtown Los Angeles, uh, and, and make it look like something that is not just his apartment building in downtown Los Angeles. Um, so yeah. And, and we came up with, you know, we both like dark, you know, um, subject matter. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we came up with this thing called the program, which was, Essentially, um, how do I? I mean, it's a dystopian future. It's dystopian. There is an alien and post-apocalyptic kind of, but the world isn't totally destroyed. Yeah. Um, but it's after an alien invasion. Um, but I didn't want it to be about like fighting aliens. Um, uh, and I also similar to they fall fast. I guess I have a theme of like, what's the point of living <laughs> a little bit. I did. I wasn't going to yeah. come right out with it, but the, I definitely see the connection and themes of, of people, People push to their limits emotionally. Yeah. I want people, yeah, exact. Push to the limits, struggling, and try to figure out: is there is what's going to get me to tomorrow? What's going to get me to the next point? And and uh, so this is a like it's basic counselor session where you know a counselor needs to sign off on you entering the program. Um, and so it's I don't know, obviously Westworld. Yeah, you don't have to give away what the yeah, program is yeah, or anything. Yeah, but it's it's it's. Um, <laughs> I, I was. I also like shows like Westworld and Humans, which just got off the air, which is about artificial intelligence. I've heard. Yeah, you know, I'm a huge Westworld fan, and I've yeah. heard I should watch Humans. I love Humans. Humans is. I think Humans and Westworld are both exploring the same theme, uh, but in artificial, specifically with artificial intelligence and consciousness. But Humans is much more intimate, much more oh, grounded. Okay. Um, Westworld is very much. You it's know, pretty big. It's big. The, world, <laughs> the scope is huge. The the world is huge. Humans is much more intimate, but it's always about the struggle to gain consciousness. So I'm like, what if, what, what if that were reverse, you know, a little bit and humans had the ability to kind of take a step back from consciousness, consciousness and, and mostly if this feeling, right. You know, like right. the thing that makes a different lo- type of giving. Yeah, up. yeah. 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 So, so it's like, I, I want to be part of this world, but I don't really want to be affected by it. Um, and what if that were possible kind of a thing. So those are the types of themes. Right. And, and, and you wrote it for a... Uh... Yeah, so the Producers Guild of America has a contest. I think it's annual. Um, I'm not 100%, 100% sure about that. But they did have it last year, last summer, where you have 51 hours to write, direct, um, and edit a short film. Which is an interesting amount of time. I guess it starts at, at noon on Friday and you have to have it in by three on yeah, Monday so or something. Yeah, it was <laughs> like almost, an extra three hours. Yeah, almost like that. It started literally on a two... Two o'clock on a Friday afternoon, um, they give you the assignment, and then you have to Friday until five to upload the actual content. Uh, on on is the assignment specific, or it's just make a short of a certain length? You no, know, it is. It is very specific. Um, so they had to, um, you know, it's based on a, a producer uh, like th- their work, and so um, so what you need to do is like. If you sign up in advance and you pay the, the submission fee, and so you have to kind of get your team together in advance. So okay. we knew, Miguel and I, that's where we were like, okay, wh- what can we – we had uh, you know, a DP editor or sound person. And I, I was talking before about free labor. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, rules is you need to – this needs to be volunteer. Um, right. So no one can be no paid. No one can be paid. And I think that's actually a fair rule because it does level the playing field if someone oh, yeah. has no money versus someone does yeah, have some, money. Someone came in with a trust fund and was going to spend 50K in, it, in a weekend. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so there I get it. And in some ways that made it easier because it was you're like, hey, we can't pay you, but here's the link. Like we're doing it for this. 
Yeah, um, we're not allowed to pay yeah, you. Yeah, so so you know. Um, and so Miguel and I, we knew going into it, like, okay, we we wanted to use his building. Um, we used his apartment, some other areas in the building we could use. Um, we had two actors. We're like, okay, we're going to make something with them. And so I knew going into it, probably some kind of therapy session would lend itself. Um, and so at 2 o'clock, they gave the assignment, which is – they give you, uh, I'm trying to remember, um, they give you like three potential settings and you must incorporate one. And for us, it was any kind of post-war era. So that's where the aliens came up. Okay, really? so, so, so yeah. you were assigned post-war. Yeah. So, so well, there was that. You could use a, literally a train station or I think a law firm office or a law or any office. So two are very physical. One is more backdrop. So we used the post-war and that's where we said, okay, this is an alien invasion that happened. And, and did said, you have any of those ideas or did they all – you just started spitballing we just started, at 2 o'clock? Um, kind of Miguel and I spitball a little bit. Um, and that's when there's a scene that – it opens where a character is running down a hallway and then we see a spaceship and we have a voiceover. So we're like, okay, you film that – like we – Miguel and I sp- were, were spitballing and we're like, okay, I'm going to go write the script – and, but this is, will be the opening of a voiceover over her running down a hallway, slow-mo. We see an alien spaceship, some destruction. Um, and, and you know, while you do that, I'm writing. So we to, to Right, me, so you were writing while he was yeah, shooting so, that first time. Yes, yeah, that's so, smart. Yeah, so we needed to just use every minute. And since there'll be voiceover, we, voiceover over the scene, we're fine. And and we kind of talked about this will be like the voiceover. Because one of the other, the, spec, the, the you had to use, there, there were five props, you had to use three of them. One of them were eyeglasses. Um, and the, one of them needed to have a very important story piece. So the reason this woman survived an alien invasion, you find out during a voice, voiceover, is because she went home to get her eyeglasses. And Instead of meeting her husband and kid at a restaurant, that got destroyed. Um, and um, the the other, so we used three things uh, of those props, other five, and the final thing were theme, and we had to explore one of two themes. And so this was, I think it was like public versus private self, your true self, your true nature. Um, and so this is a woman who, you know, her true self was. She didn't want to be a wife. She didn't want to be a mother. She didn't want to be all these things that right. Others. The fact that they were killed was almost yeah. She was ready to leave them, you know. And like I think she says, uh, there, a line is like, "I'm I'm sad that I'm sad that I lost them, but I'm sad that they're gone, but only that they're gone in this way." Because she wanted them to still be alive and living yeah. in the world, but she didn't want to. She didn't have that strong urge to be a mother that she thought she would, or be a wife that she thought she would. So. Which is very human and very mm. normal that no one is willing to admit. <laughs> I think so. I mean, like sometimes you, you have a dream, you want these things, and then you get it. You're like, oh, okay. That's maybe not as... Well, the- and I'm at this stage where I, I know a lot of parents, and they uh, some admit it. Mm. Some admit it. That the the face, Facebook posts are a lie. <laughs> Facebook is a lie. Oh my god! Facebook posts. My child is the most precious. Mm-hmm. They're my heart and soul, and the reason I get up in the morning. Yeah, and, and it's not like, oh my god, when they go away to camp for a month, it's the best thing ever. Right, I can be me. You know, I mean, I'm not a parent, so you know, I don't understand that. But uh, that that I, I understand it on a on a like. Yeah, uh, on a, well, and part of a family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, uh, but uh, I mean, the closest I have is I spent a uh, few years teaching, um, and I spent ten months being Mister McCarthy, and and then the summer happened, and then I had two months to find Ed. And yeah, that's, that's how. Yeah. I, and actually, you know, when when you talked about teaching, I I thought of you know and how it it you could tell you would become the teacher everyone hated, yeah. but yeah, because you have to. I mean, you are parenting other people's kids all day yeah yeah as well as teaching because the kids don't come in ready they don't come in ready um they some do some don't it's very much a mixed bag and when you had at that time i don't know what it is now but a class of 34 students yeah i mean you're you're teaching the human you're teaching humanity not just the humanities right you're absolutely right you you have to be a model for how, how to behave not just not just like you know this is what a topic sentence is um, so yeah, so, so yeah, so the, the, and based on this, Miguel and I are now turning the program into, um, hopefully we're developing into a TV show. So a pilot mm-hmm. that, that those two characters in the short 
will be part of it and their storyline is part of it, but it's much more of an ensemble piece where right. yeah. world building about the aliens, the politics, you know, what led to this type of, you know, program being such a viable option. Um, you know, so, so we're branching that out and fingers crossed, you know, we can film it, you know, get some kind of budget together and film it at some point, you know, probably an hour. Hour yeah, series. yeah, yeah. I see it as an yeah. hour long, so the script will be in the fifty to sixty page range. Um, and it's a cool concept. Yeah, and there must you must be having fun with it? All the places you can go. I definitely. Yeah, we. Um, I and it is. I, I'll give you full credit. It's completely original. Um, We've had countless. I can't name how many alien invasion films we've had, but it's never been done that way. Yeah, I, I the alien invasion stuff is always like it's about us versus the aliens, yeah. and, and then we figure out that Achilles heel right. where we win. Exactly, exactly, and and you know, obviously, if there's going to be an alien invasion, that needs to be a very substantial narrative, you know, thread. Uh, but I don't want it to be about that. Um, it's it's kind of nihilistic and it's kind of government control. Um, you know, it, it is a little bit of today, you know, the 1%, uh, the upper echelon of, of wealth owning so much and controlling as a result of that, controlling so much. So that is what the fundamentals behind the program are, you know, um, and why it was created and stuff. And, you know, there's, you know, if, if we're detached from emotions, people can use that for good and bad things, you know? Um, and, and so the alien invasion is just one aspect of that, you know? Um, it just, yeah. it's just, it's just exacerbated it because since then in this world, um, enrollment into the program has greatly increased. Um, because what's the point if we were able to, we were the, the highest functioning, um, life form on earth. And what if one day something changes and that's not the case. And now we can be squashed, uh, very simply, um, like we can squash an ant kind of. A thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We have no idea what it's like to be beta. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have, we haven't been that way yeah. for, I imagine since the hunter gatherer days, yeah. we didn't feel very alpha, we, but once we started farming, we thought we we could you we know. can we literally rule the world yeah yeah and yeah we get to change we get to change the planet to suit us versus yeah. versus us changing to versus suit. us just trying to not get yeah. eaten so some people can't live in that world so or don't know how you don't know how to live in that world so yeah, that I don't want to get too political but I think we've seen as of late when people who think they're alphas <laughs> when they find out they just have equals not yeah. that they're behind people yeah, exactly but finding out they're equal to others is more than they can take it's it's and and yeah they don't know how to process that it's yeah. literally like a foreign so, concept all great sci-fi is metaphor yeah yeah so. and this is turning into that absolutely Very absolutely cool. so um so yeah we're we're developing that um and you know the hope is to film it in Portugal, obviously, uh, honestly. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah, because Miguel is, like I said, Portuguese. He's there now. He has, you know, he 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 um, worked on TV and TV before moving to Los Angeles, and he created a couple shows in Portugal. Um, so he has a lot of connections there. Very cool. So it must be in Lisbon. Uh, I or think, no? Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> I mean, so. I think yeah. Lisbon's, yeah. you know, it's one of those countries where the capital is almost everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so and honestly, you know, the indie spirit um, – trying to do an indie pilot that's in the 50 to 60 minute range here, you know, a, a, an hour of television generally costs millions, and millions of dollars, um, uh, for network or cable, um, doing it indie, uh, it's even if a couple hundred thousand is, is kind of not realistic, um, to try to scrape together that kind of money. Um, but it's cheaper if we do it. In Portugal. Yeah, in Portugal. Yeah. That's very cool. I think it's still being English and stuff and some beautiful countrysides and things like that. And and it's also going to be like we kind of want the setting. We don't know if it's going to be set in the United States specifically or a country that is just yeah. allegory. Well, and the truth is uh, the southern Mediterranean is very California anyway. He said I that. Mean, when, when you're yeah. there, you, you feel like you're home. Yeah. Well, I'm a California native, so yeah. Yeah, and he said from, that he from goes, Portugal straight over to Turkey. It's yeah. like it's kind of the same climate. Yeah, he <laughs> said people won't realize that it's not California. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, thus the spaghetti western was yeah. was a was a staple. Mm. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, remember because yeah. it was couldn't tell it from you the, couldn't tell uh, from, from the west. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's that. And, that's you know, that. And, and you said you're writing, oh, well, pursuing other things. And yeah, so I'm finishing one TV pilot, um, and I'm going to be starting with the pilot for the. I have it outlined, kind of, um, to start writing that. Yeah. Um, and then you have that feature that's the feature embryonic that's, that's, that you think you might want to direct. Yeah, yeah. Um, that it's very personal and close. You know, I'm a gay man. I'm married. Um, um, but it's 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 about very broadly um because i haven't finalized you know some of it's it's about what does it mean to be masculine um when you're when 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 a medical like when you get illness that kind of takes away some of that things that you would uh otherwise assume define your masculinity for example like you get like diagnosed with something that starts taking away your body hair. Right. Um, and, and, you know, there are plenty of guys who don't have it, but if you grow up and you have it, you know, full chest, chest hair and, and, and things like that, you know, as, as evolved as you think you are and you don't have gender hangups and things like that. Um, if you know, what if you start losing that and it kind of changes the way you perceive, not just yourself, but you know, how masculine you are or aren't, um, you know, yeah, no, and how you feel the world's perceiving you when you go out into it. Yeah, exactly. And and I do think the last few years, you know, a lot of toxic masculinity has very much been, um, you know, a discussion topic in, in not just everyday life, but also in, in stories that we're seeing and reading. Um, you know, I, I do think exploring what masculinity is, is an interesting topic. Um, you know, what it means and how we define it. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't like the phrase soft masculinity. I've heard that. Um, but no, that's, that's one of the things that's one of my pet peeves is, <laughs> is, is toxic masculinity is a real thing. But I feel like so many people mistake that to mean masculinity is toxic, but it's not all no. masculinity is not toxic. No, it's harassment and rape. And yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, it's the, just, those those things are toxic. Absolutely. And trying to use it as some kind of, you know, yeah. the traits of masculinity as something as a dominant yeah. force and um, an oppressive force. But, you know, there are like, you know, things that we grow up. I, and I think guys, especially, you know, in America, uh, grow up with there's preconceived motion, notions of this equals masculinity. Like, like you know, sports. Ag- sports ag- aggressive behavior, and, and being fights, being possibly. Being built. And, you know, we yeah. were talking before about those Marvel movies. And, and look at, the, you know, Captain America holding a helicopter in one hand and a building in another. And we see these biceps that are, like, yeah. insane. Unreal, yeah. Um, and these ideas of masculinity, how a body should look and, you know, having, you know... Uh, you know, body hair or manscaping and things like that. Um, so, you know, as, as, as healthy as you can be, you know, or think you are, uh, when something in life, you you know, directly attacks your body, that kind of changes it. Um, and so if these masculine traits, you know, uh, you know, and and this story is going to be probably like cancer, um, that then, you know, uh, changes, um, you know, what if, in this case, to treat the cancer, you have to take testosterone um, blockers. So, you know, what what happens uh, when you have no longer are producing that and your life, you know, your body starts changing as a result. So, yeah. So that it'll be right up my alley. I'll tell you why later. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. Sound, sounds sounds. So yeah, that's, that's, very that's good. the beginning stages of it. So a gay couple who've been together for a while who are married, um, and you know, right. So also you have a relationship dynamic exactly. when when a when a, a a partner and a partnership has a change, it's always uh, it's, it's, it's it's time of stress. Yeah, it's act absolutely, and and it, a time of reinvention. Um, it's you know sometimes you don't want to change, but life happens and. And so you are either going to have to reinvent and change and find your new normal or you're going to implode. So which is it going to be? You know, you, you if, if you can't control the change, um, you can't ignore it. And some people do. Um, and I think that's when life crumbles. So I think you're you're one of the admirable writers who you're not sitting down going, 
what's a really commercial kind of I, you oh, know I what I mean? I, I, I mean, wish I did. Oh, maybe, <laughs> but, but what you're doing is you're, you're identifying really human stories and things that interest you and things you would go see. And that's, that's excellent. Yeah. I mean, I, right. Like this will be something that is, I mean, this in is a deep house, intelligent you know. story, right? It's, or I, I'm going to definitely do everything I can to make it that way and yeah. make it look, or you can you make know. it a melodrama, make it all about the heartstrings. Just make me cry for half an hour. Hopefully, I mean, 90 minutes. Hopefully I'll do both. Yeah. Hopefully I'll make and, it and, and you can. can. Yeah. I, I kind of want to like, you know, you know, make it I think mean, you for did with They Fall Fast. Yeah. I get, yeah. yeah. I kind of like those movies that make you think and then suddenly you're sucker punched and then you're like, I'm crying now. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I'm also gay, so I like really melodramatic stuff too. So, you know, it depends <laughs> so on my it. mood. Depends on my mood. So, so be it. I yeah. love, I love when a film makes me cry. Although I think I cry at happiness more than sadness. Like, like a really touching moment of joy, I think makes me a little weepier than that is ch- than I, sadness. I, 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 I'm equal to both. I, you know, when you said that, the, the, the scene that popped in is the end of Little Miss Sunshine. And how much I was crying at the end of that because the family came together for each other and they were all dancing that stupid dance at the end. Yeah, um, that's so, a pretty wonderful. One. Yeah, and I was just smile, smiling and crying at that. That yeah. so yeah. I for do. me, it's Whale Rider. I don't know if you saw Whale Rider. Oh, I, I, yes, I think that's I think I need about half a day after that film mm-hmm. to like. I just have to keep re-adding more fluids because I can't stop crying. I'm always crying thinking about it. Yeah. So I'll stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I remember seeing that in the theater going, this is so impressive. Yeah. yeah. And just a beautiful ending. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful movie. Good times. But yeah, you know, I guess I'm attracted to ideas um, and then find how do I get the emotion? What's the emotional entry into this idea? And that was Ed McCarthy who I didn't even mention the intro, is a super nice guy. God, he's such a good person. All right, so you should watch his film. That's They Fall Fast, and it's in Season 2, Episode 3 of the Discovery Indie Film TV series, which you can watch right now on Amazon Prime Video. Just go to Prime Video, search for Discovery Indie Film, and give it a watch. You can also go to discoveryindiefilm.com and get links. And if you want the social media, if that's your thing, at DIF Wins is the handle for Discovery Indie Film on instagram facebook and twitter and the only things i also have to mention is the sherman oaks film festival that showed ed's film that's every november in sherman oaks california and you can learn all about that at sherman oaks ff.com or on social media it's at sherman oaks ff not too hard to figure that out and then another festival program is film invasion la and that's at film invasion la on social media and the website's film invasion com. All right, I think that's all I got for you. Thanks for listening.